This is one of several boards I have created to make working with electronic stuff easier, so that I don't have to keep putting stuff in breadboards every time I just have it ready. This one is a three-button board that is debalanced. These are some 555 timers acting like Schmidt triggers. So this way, anytime I need to use a debalanced button like to drive the clock signal of a chip, I can just plug this in, press the button, and there you go. So this is the button I'm using. I got a whole box of them, and they're pretty neat. They can be mounted on a control panel or whatever. They come with hardware, but unfortunately they don't fit in a breadboard, and I knew that going in, but I didn't pay attention to how weird the shape was. The fact that they're kind of, you know, thin but wide, and as you can see, they definitely are not going to fit into a proto board. So since I've been trying to get into copper clad boards and electrolysis and all this other stuff, I said, why not go ahead and make my own out of a copper clad board? So these are just simple little PCBs with no holes or anything. And one side has copper, the other side, because you have to solder to the copper. So the components go on the, the non-copper side. I decided to get the signal sided because they're cheaper. And so of course I had to drill holes. So I went online and I got some little drill bits. They they range as small as 0.3 millimeters, and yes, they break extremely easily, but they were very cheap. And lucky they came in a two-pack, so I have spares. So I did some testing to try and figure out how I'm going to drill holes for these switches, because everything else is easy. You just use the drill bit and you make some holes. Like here, I was testing the holes to fit the 8-pin dip, and I was trying to do it so that... It was roughly the shape, because see how it's wide but it's thin? But I discovered that it is incredibly difficult to try and drill a hole and then make the hole bigger with a drill. What you'd really do in a situation like that is you would drill a hole, and then you'd use a jigsaw and stick it in there and widen the hole that way. You know, you start with a pilot hole. The trouble is, my jigsaw blade is nowhere near that small, and it's almost impossible to, to actually get this working, so I just decided on making gigantic holes. So there's a lot of open space, but as it turns out, that was fine. So there's no problem at all. Just make big holes, they're nice and easy. So here, and I'll go over the circuit later, but right now I just wanted to show you. Electrolysis I'm going to do later, where you have to mask and everything, but I just used a Dremel. I drilled holes, and then I used a Dremel to basically cut grooves in the copper just to separate, and it worked great. And so, like, this entire area down here, all of this copper is connected to positive, and all of this is connected to ground. So you've got these two little planes. It never hurts to have more metal, it just hurts to have not enough. And then here's the big holes for the switches, and everything else is just protoboard size. Here's the other side where you can see the holes. And you can see where the holes are jagged because I cut from the copper side because I wanted the copper side to be cleaner. Whenever you drill, the entrance hole looks pretty good because it digs right in a cylindrical motion. But the drill, even if you're careful, even if you're very gentle, at some point, the drill is going to push out and splinter the other side. The only way to avoid that would be to drill from both sides, and that's really hard to do to line it up. So I decided this side is irrelevant. I wanted the copper to look good, so I drilled from the copper side, and then these holes didn't much matter if they were not perfect. Guess what, though? <laughs> That means I did it backwards, because I had drawn this out on a piece of paper, and I drilled the holes, and I gouged out all the lines, and right when I was about to solder the chips in, I said, wait, I'm soldering from the other side. <laughs> it's backwards. So I took the timers. I said, okay, I can either scrap this and do it again, or... I can just do the Tim Taylor thing. I just bent the pins backwards. This is the top of the chip. You can barely see the words. See? Any 555P. So, I just bent the pins backwards. And for some reason, the universe has decided to let me get away with this because it worked just fine. I imagine if you bent these a couple times, they snap right off, but one single careful bend, it worked just fine. So, there you go. So, here they are. This is the underside of the chip. <laughs> Oh, uh, anyway. So it's three separate debound circuits. It's arranged from this side. I would have centered it better if I'd thought of it, but I put the chips in the center and then the buttons were here and I'm like, I have nothing to put over here, but it's fine. But yeah, it's just, it's the simple pull-up resistor and capacitor RC network and then the draining resistor with the switch. Like I said, I'll go over the circuit in a minute, but you just plug in positive and negative here and there you go. And the holes here were not perfect, so it's a little crooked, but that's okay. Here's the other side so you can see the soldering. The soldering went great. I had to be careful with 
the switches because you had these giant freaking holes. So I would solder the hole. So you'd put the, the, the button in here. I keep saying switch. It's a momentary switch. So it's only filling up a small amount of the hole. So what I did was I soldered. I put it in the hole and I soldered basically on either side of the tine. Like I'd solder on this side and I'd solder on this side and then joined around. And that way I didn't just dump a bunch of solder down the giant hole. So... I, I basically just held the warmth long enough for the solder to begin to run up the leg of the button, and that was good. And yes, that is one thing I learned thanks to my viewers. Thank you, viewers. When you have a situation like this where there's a lot of metal, soldering like these, where you've got all this metal, it was heat sinking the soldering iron, so I had to hold it for a long time, and then the whole thing was hot. So... If it doesn't solder right, remember you have to, you know, maybe turn the temperature up and hold it there for a minute to make sure it gets warm so it adheres. But that's all it was. That was the only challenging one. Everything else, solder behaves, it, it sticks to metal and it doesn't stick to non-metal, uh, uh, essentially. So everywhere there was a gouge, it just kind of domed up and it never tried to run. I only accidentally bridged it one time. Here, I've held it up with a lamp behind it so you can see the gouges. It's a pretty neat effect, but it's a little more clear, you know, removing the copper and how the solder is not in any of the, the gouges, the grooves at all. So yeah, it, it, it soldered great. It worked out fine. And you got these giant things of metal, so I had to use extra solder to make sure it stayed on because it wanted to spread over the whole thing. So I had to make sure it stayed in a little bubble instead of pouring all the way across. And then I've got the three pins for the signals. These are the signal outs and then positive and negative. And so because it's physical switches, it'll run on any voltage. The it feed it doesn't have an external supply. So it feeds or an internal supply rather. I don't have a USB plug. It feeds the 555 timers using this signal. So you are going to want to power it from something reasonably strong, but that's fine. You could add a USB header and power the chips from the USB header if you wanted. I decided it wasn't necessary in this case. So here's the circuit. The the cont pin and the discharge pin I just don't have connected to anything at all. Threshold and trigger are tied together. Reset is just tied high. I've got the little arrows here, so it takes the external voltage. So the output is here. That's the, the output pin. And then the magic of it is just here. You've got your... Your RC network and LRG is large and small, so you have a large resistor and a small capacitor. That way the capacitor discharges extremely quickly, but it does not charge up. It charges up very slowly. I've got this configured like 100 milliseconds or something. I don't know what it was, but it's around that. Just use whatever sizes work for you. You want a very fast discharge time and a very slow charge time to get the debouncing working correctly. And then I have an extremely small resistor. I think I used 56 ohms. I'd used 24 ohms at some other point, I think. So this one should be incredibly tiny. That's just so that the power doesn't surge through. Because I discovered if... It, it's perfectly safe. You could hook this capacitor up straight to the switch and discharge it that way with less than an ohm of resistance. It'll work fine. It's not going to heat up or anything. But it actually manages to surge the chip. I discovered that. The, the nice clean output just gets the balance on the output. So a very small resistor in series with the switch discharging the capacitor allows the chip to remain better behaved. It would actually be good to have added a capacitor on the cont pin, capacitor to ground, and a capacitor across the power supply, positive to negative, of each of these chips. That would have been good, but I decided it wasn't necessary. It doesn't cause that much of a problem. It's good enough. And here is a drawing I've done to illustrate the gouges I made. And we can compare it directly to the actual gouges. So you see here, I disconnected discharge and cont, and here they are. See, I did it backwards. I should have done it the other way, but that's fine. Now, what you could have done is just cut off those pins. You could have just cut the discharge and cont pins off, but I decided to leave a tiny bit of copper just so I could solder it in for stability. I, ju I just wanted it to be nice and secure in there. So then the output pin is tied to the actual output pin. There's that circle, see? And then down here we can see the positive is going to be in this hole. So this entire piece of metal here, all of this metal, is positive. So here's the pull-up resistor going to trigger and threshold. And you can see the threshold, the trigger, this pin of the resistor, this pin of the capacitor, and this pin of this resistor. Here it is, one, two, three, four, five holes. So it's actually under the chip. The I just tied it under the chip, the two pins together, because why run a jumper when you can just leave the copper there? And then the reset pin is just here, 
in this metal, no, no jumper, it's just in the, the positive plane, and the other side of the pull-up resistor is here. So that's just, again, in this plane, it doesn't matter. You know, you're using 5 volts or something, it's perfectly safe. And then here, the ground, that's just in, these, these are the, uh, here, these are the ground pins. These are the ground pins here, just in the ground plane, and there's the ground hole, see, up here. And then this resistor from trigger, it, uh, it goes to one side of the switch, the button, momentary switch. And then the other side of the switch goes into the ground plane. So here it is. So the resistor, so the resistor would be here, and here's the other leg of the resistor to one leg of the switch, and then the other leg. And then finally the capacitor. So the capacitor would be here, and here's the other side of the capacitor in the ground plane. It's, it's great. It's, I came up with this idea. I, I basically looked at the pinout of the chip. I said, the chip is going to be the hardest thing to figure out, because every Everything else has got wires. It's got legs. I can just run it however long in whatever direction I want. So let's start with the chip and figure out how I want it laid out. And I got the idea because here's reset and here's VCC and here's this. And I'm like, well, why can't I just have it all connected? So there you go. So this is how you can use a copper clad board, a Dremel or other rotary tool, whatever you want, manual scraper, any way to get the copper off, and a drill. You just need to get your little drill bits because 1 16th of an inch is the smallest my regular drill bit set goes. And that's way bigger than this. These are one millimeter. Uh, I also use point, well, I broke one of my one millimeter, so I also used 0.9 millimeter. That seemed to work fine. And then, of course, this, I don't know what it was. It was just whatever size this fits in. But that was a regular drill bit. But <laughs> in my first attempt, I broke quite a few drill bits. I broke quite a few drill bits trying out different methods. And you can see the raggedy copper here from drilling from the other side. So definitely drill from the copper side. And then these are Dremel test holes. But yeah, so that's it. So I will be doing this with electrolysis with a mask in the future. You know, a proper with traces PCB. But for something like this, this works just fine. It works just fine. It's nice and easy. Not one single jumper. Not one single jumper. It's so pretty. But anyway, that's enough for this board. On to the next. Until then, I'll be seeing you.